Um, so what I wanted to do today really was just um, a kind of review or do a little summary of what, what was discussed in the last few weeks. Um, gesture towards or say a little bit about a few things that um, we didn't get to, to discuss in the time and then also um, respond or uh, talk about some of um, the issues that uh, struck uh, people or other ethical issues that were of interest to some of you uh, that you told Liz about. So, uh, so we'll try and do a mix of everything. So um, first, I think a recap is in order because it's quite a number of weeks since the first week when I was when I was here giving the introductory talk. Um, so we began the summer program um, looking in the first week at what we mean by practical ethics, what practical ethics is and how it relates uh, to other branches of moral philosophy. And we then, we then gestured towards in the first week uh, some of the areas of concern or areas of interest for practical ethicists, speaking in just a little bit about a few of them. And um, then in the second week, um, Ben introduced the concept of and questions related to uh, intergenerational justice. So both justice between overlapping generations and between existing, gen existing generations and generations in the distant future. And specifically, Ben raised and discussed questions of whether there are distinct ways in which different generations should treat each other, and whether different age groups or generations are entitled to different things, and whether we have duties or obligations to generations in the distant future. Um, or how should we act when the choices that we make will determine not how things are for those in the distant future, um, but also perhaps their very identities. So then discuss the, the non-identity problem in, in population ethics as well. Then in the third week, Gary um, introduced and explored the problem of wild animal suffering talking about wild animal ethics and contrasting it with, with environmentalism. Um, Gary highlighted the extent of suffering in nature, the different types of suffering, uh, how so many animals in nature suffer from disease, starvation, predation, conflict, injury, etc. And he raised the question of whether um, we should intervene. He anticipated some objections to the thought of intervening in nature. Um, responded to them and then suggested some ways in which we can and do intervene to help alleviate wild animal suffering. Um, so just providing medical care in the case of injury, vaccinations to try and combat uh, contagious diseases um, and rescuing animals uh, that have, let's say, uh, in the case of whales being beached or others that have got into to difficulties. And um, he also emphasised some problems we, and some suffering we have yet to find ways to successfully address or, in, or help avoid. Then in the fourth week, um, Banesh spoke about the relationship between practical ethics and law. Um, he presented some vignettes from capacity law and he looked at what the law says about how um, we should live our lives and asked um, what the law does or does not uh, get right um, in matters of practical ethical concern. Um, okay, sorry, now my slide didn't move there for me, but I think it's gone there now. Okay, <laughs> then in week five, uh, Katrine spoke about the concept of laziness. Um, so Katrine um, highlighted how the concept of laziness is currently under theorized. Um, and she asked, uh, she asked whether there's a need to rethink our um, view, our attitudes or our beliefs about laziness. Um, she drew attention to the shortcomings of the current debate on laziness and have emphasised how our current use of the concept um, results in widespread harm. In week six, Brian spoke about the ethics of love drugs. Um, explained what we mean by love drugs and um, spoke about the obligations that we may have to study the interpersonal effects 
various drugs that are widely prescribed. Then he introduced the concerns that would arise if we were to use um, certain drugs for these interpersonal effects, uh, concerns about medicalization, threats to authenticity, a narrow focus on biology um, of people and the biological aspects of love. Um, and then he offered some thoughts as to how this medicalization could be better directed um, in the service of good ends. And then last week, Hazem spoke about collective minds and brain to brain interfaces. Um, when uh, there can be a direct communication between the brain of one animal and another. And he emphasized how he was engaging in speculative ethics and in thinking about the far distant future and the prospect of collective minds, how they might be used and the new questions uh, that uh, the prospect of these would raise um, for big concepts in ethics, like autonomy, responsibility, authenticity and identity. So I hope that summarizes what kind of we covered what we spoke about in the last number of weeks. Just a, a quick whiz through. Um, so what we want to look at now is what's next for practical ethics. I hope you can all still hear me okay. Okay, with good. Um, so in some ways, what's next for practical ethics um, is very much what is currently uh, at issue for practical ethics. So very many of the ethical issues that that practical ethicists are concerned with uh, continue to be controversial and continue to demand much more work and research. Um, so we still, let's say practical ethicists still are faced with the task of confronting and the, the ethical issues arise in everyday life. We still have to, to address questions like how do we distribute resources in healthcare? Um, or how do we tackle the problem of decision making in healthcare when um, there is problems with uh, with this uncertainty about um, the capacity or the, the competence of individuals to make decisions um, and who is responsible for making the decisions in those cases? So there are very many issues that that um, were currently interest of current interest to practical ethicists that will continue to be for very many years to come. However, there are also some new concerns that always arise because of emerging technologies or our changing world. Um, so features sometimes that arise because of, uh, as a result of our changing planet. So issues that arise because we're living on a planet that's constantly changing and bringing with it new challenges. Issues that arise because of um, our increased interconnectedness as a planet increased globalization and what differences that make to the extent of our obligations. And related to what Hazem was speaking about last week in more speculative ethics, there are ethical issues that arise in the face in, as new scientific and technological developments uh, come about. And these sometimes lead us to speculate about what might follow um, from these developments in, in the future. So I want to say a little bit about some of these um, areas of interest to practical ethics, to practical ethicists, um, when it comes to uh, technological development or changes in technology. So one um, big area of interest to practical ethicists that we didn't talk about uh, specifically or you know, in one of the sessions during this program uh, is the ethics of artificial intelligence and robotics. So, I think it would hardly escape people's notice that this is something that's a, a big area of a big point of discussion um, in the media and um, everywhere we look. Uh, and of course, it's something that uh, is of concern to, to practical ethicists. Um, and having a novel um, artificial intelligences, having more intelligent AI than before, um, brings with this a host of, of issues. So some related to things like privacy and surveillance. So these aren't new issues, they, they pertain to other areas too. But we might be worried that um, as technological advances continue to come, um, these worries will be these worries will be amplified. So um, currently um, 
many AI systems and, and um, many institutions are able to collect and process uh, people's information auto automatically uh, through automated systems, which raises concerns about um, how data is stored. And um, usually we think people have a sort of epistemic access or a privileged access to, to their information. And when we have um, more and more ways of, of artificial intelligence systems uh, finding out this information and storing it, um, then, then we do have concerns about how this data will be used and how it will be, uh, who will gain access to it. As, as AI develops as well, there's more and more sophisticated sort of um, machines or technologies, facial recognition technology and things like this as well. And, and that could be seen as um, amplifying um, our, uh, the concerns about privacy interests. That facial rec recognition technologies could be used in ways that undermine or, or threaten our privacy. Um, another area of interest uh, in AI ethics is that of um, autonomous systems and responsibility um, when it comes to the actions of autonomous systems. So by this I mean things like, let's say, self-driving cars. Um, so this is, of course, a, a big uh, area that has been developed, the possibility and the use of self-driving cars. There's obvious advantages to this, but there are some concerns then about what happens if things go wrong and um, so there can understandably be accidents and there's lots of um, questions as to first of all if there are accidents where does the responsibility for them lie and in order to avoid such accidents how can these sort of um, uh, systems be ethically developed so should we have um, some sort of ethical settings with respect to decision making um, in the, with these machines so if these um, self-driving cars are to make decisions, difficult decisions that one might encounter on the road, should they um, have ethical settings incorporated such that they can um, make decisions as, as would be ethically appropriate, as we would deem to be ethically appropriate? Or should it be the case that meaningful um, human control is maintained, that these uh, autonomous systems are not wholly autonomous, that some human control is maintained? Um, questions like this. So these are all um, new questions that our uh, practical ethicists are confronted with today. Um, and then there are other questions about the moral status of artificial intelligence machines. Um, so the questions about whether um, ro certain intelligent robots have rights. Are they entitled to moral rights? Um, so, so to some people it might sound absurd to speak about robots having rights. However, as robots become more advanced, as artificial intelligence has become more advanced, it becomes difficult to, to um, uh, discount or deny at least the possibility that they might be entitled to moral rights. Um, so one author recently, John Danaher, has argued that um, if a robot is performatively equivalent um, to another entity that has significant moral status, then it is right and proper to afford them the same moral status because we only have epistemic access to their, their behavior. And if a robot performs in a way um, that, is, that is the same, then consistency would demand, given that we cannot know the inner, and um, that we afford them um, consideration that would um, reflect moral status of those to which they perform uh, equivalently to. So these are all the questions. There's other questions about AI, questions about opacity. How do we deal with these systems where we, we may not understand or know what's going on inside them? How do we respond in that sort of case? And questions then about bias in machines. And um, so will we perpetuate or um, build into these machines biases that exist um, in the human population? And how should we um, counter that? So these are all questions that uh, are new, relatively new, or certainly um, increasingly um, important for practical ethicists to address. Many of you may be familiar with the, the ethical debate on human enhancement. Um, so the debate about whether, um, and when we say human enhancement, you're usually in, in philosophical circles, we're talking about human bioenhancement. 
and um, that's the use of biomedical interventions to improve human capacities or their performance, their well-being or the dispositions beyond the scope of traditional medicine. So let's say the taking of pharmaceuticals and um, to improve cognitive performance or to improve morality, what we might call moral enhancement and um, things like this. So there's lots of questions about if um, we have certain um, biological means to enhance ourselves um, beyond what would be the case in uh, traditional medicine, uh, is it permissible for us to do this? Um, and, and the further question then, is it obligatory for us to do it in certain circumstances? Um, so proponents of the permissibility of human enhancement um, typically um, embrace um, enhancement that uh, enhances human welfare. Um, so some say that it's permissible as a means to enhance human welfare, that people are entitled to use things if they so wish to, that will enhance their, their abilities, um, their cognitive abilities or their mood or their dispositions, um, whatever. And, and some authors argue, so Pearson Zavalescu argued that some um, forms of human bioenhancement are obligatory. And so they argue that um, moral enhancement, certain forms of moral enhancement, um, if, they're become, if there are biomedical means in the near future, in the, at least in the medium term future, to enhance um, our moral capacities, our moral cognition, our capacities for empathy, um, then they argue that we should um, use them if we want to protect the human species from the behaviours that we um, carry out that threaten humanity, humanity's existence. So let's say like the depletion of nat natural resources um, or war, terrorism, things like that, so that there is actually uh, an obligation on us to try and morally enhance ourselves such that we, we do not continue to, to behave uh, carry out these behaviours. But of course, at the other side, there's quite a lot of people who um, are opposed to the idea of human bioenhancement, or at least are sceptical about it. So there's some worries. So there's some egalitarian worries. So some worry that if um, such enhancements were available, that they would only be available to the world's wealthy. This might exacerbate existing inequalities. And that would be a reason against um, in introducing them or making them available or allowing their use. In some circumstances, then people are worried about cheating. So let's say in competitive settings, so let's say doping in sport um, or doping for uh, examinations if someone were to take um, cognitively, cognitive enhancing um, medications in advance of participating in a test or something like that. So some people worry about that, the, the unfairness in using enhancements in certain settings. And then others worry about, let's say, if we were to um, alter the human genome, alter ourselves genetically, so making changes that will persist down through the generations. And some worry that in this case, we might um, infringe the liberty of future generations, and that we might infringe um, their freedom because they cannot consent to the changes that we would, we would make. Um, and then there are some more conservative positions about enhancement. So worries that, um, that it's something that we just shouldn't do, that it's playing God, um, that it's um, something that is um, against nature or it threatens uh, human dignity, that it threatens something valuable about humanity. Um, and that's the, as a consequence then that it's something that we, that we shouldn't do. Um, so these positions have been objected to and, and, and uh, lots of objections can be raised against these more conservative positions, but they nevertheless, a lot of people feel that there's an intu intuition that we shouldn't um, be using these, these sort of uh, technologies uh, to enhance ourselves, to make us transcend our, our humanity. Okay, um, so I want to just say a few more things now. I'm just trying to, I've pressed something there and my screen, my, my slide share has gone. Is it still there for you? Is my slide we, still there? Yeah, we can see the human enhancement slide. With, Perfect. Uh, okay. okay, so I want to just mention one of the things that's kind of related to human enhancement and the use of what, you, what we might call neurotechnologies in criminal justice. 
And the reason I, I mentioned this is because, well, this is something that I'm currently working on. So I like to think it's something that's uh, quite uh, to the forefront of, of, of practical ethical research at the moment. But um, it's related to the, to the human enhancement debate in that it's uh, about the permissibility or otherwise of using um, various interventions um, that uh, act upon the brain or, or target the brain for uh, cr criminal justice, uh, for correctional purposes or rehabilitative purposes in, in criminal justice. So, for example, um, related to what Brian was saying about the side effects of particular uh, prescribed medications and related to the enhancement debate, there are um, some existing pharmaceuticals, uh, for example, that have some side effects that may have criminal justice applications in the future. So, for example, that there is some uh, pharmaceuticals that improve impulse control or um, attenuate aggression. And there's some speculation that there may also be some brain stimulation techniques, let's say like transcranial magnetic stimulation, where um, magnets are placed on the surface of, of the head that can um, also um, target areas of the brain that um, are associated with impulsivity and aggression. And as and when more, um, more is known about the, the effects of certain uh, medications or pharmaceuticals uh, and their, their influence on the brain, um, it may be the case that we have uh, interventions which could be used or harnessed for the rehabilitative potential. So they could be used alongside conventional rehabilitative measures in criminal justice. And obviously then there are lots of ethical issues arise. How how might it be permissible to use them? When, if ever, is it? And concerns about whether it would be permissible to use them in the context of criminal justice um, in the absence of offenders' consent or in cases where consent is, is dubious because of the coercive environment in which offenders are placed. And then there are further concerns then about um, whether it be a violation of offenders' rights if they were administered in the absence of valid consent and in a separate sort of difference around whether offenders actually have a right to be offered um, interventions that promise to facilitate their rehabilitation, whether they actually have a positive right to be offered. So these are, it's quite a, a, a big debate on, on this. And again, some of it is speculative ethics, as Hazan was saying, but some of it um, is nearer at hand than, than we might think. And um, relatedly, um, there's also um, a lot of debate into the potential use of crime predictive technologies. So let's say the use of brain scans or hormone assays or measurements of certain metabolites, etc., to try and predict whether someone is likely to reoffend and whether they have a use in criminal justice, let's say, in determining whether offender um, can be released um, and, and in avoiding, let's say, continued use of preventative detention. Um, if there's uncertainty about whether offender is at risk, whether these technologies might be helpful, and whether again they should or should not be used. Okay, so I just want to mention a little bit. I hope you're all still following me okay. I just want to mention a little bit about some issues um, that that you uh, raised um, with Liz that you wished to discuss um, in, a, in, this hour, in, in this hour last week. So um, one question that came up was the question, and this, this is relevant for very many of the things that, that were discussed um, over the seven weeks prior to this, is um, to what extent do individuals have a responsibility to address um, social, political or planetary concerns? Um, so the, the, the idea here is that should it be something that we leave to government or institutions? How is individual morality um, of big relevance here to some very big problems. Um, so let's say pro problems that affect um, wider society, the world. Um, now, so it's a very good question um, because sometimes, and we'll talk a little bit about it, but sometimes there's um, very little an individual uh, change, uh, individual's action might do to, to make a difference. But in some circumstances, um, the individual can make a difference um, to, to certain social concerns. Um, 
so many of you are very familiar. I would imagine, I think some of you have come across uh, Peter Singer's um, uh, thought experiment involving uh, the child drowning in a pond. And Singer points out that, you know, if we were walking past a child drowning in a pond, we could save that child with only getting our suit wet, for example, that we would think that we have an obligation to save that child. And he goes further to claim uh, that we would, uh, uh, that people would still think that we have an obligation to help the child, even if there were other people there who could also help. So Singer's point here is that there is a, a duty of easy rescue, that we have a moral obligation to, to benefit others or to prevent harms to others, when doing so entails a small cost to ourselves. So someone could argue that individuals have responsibility to do something if their, their actions can make some difference at, at very little cost. So for some things, this might be relevant. So it might be the case that Singer argues that we should do, do um, something to help the global poor because let's say by donating to a charity that is effective at, at saving the lives of others, that we're doing some good and we have a duty to do it when we can do that at relatively um, small cost to ourselves and without sacrificing anything of, of moral significance or major moral significance. However, it can be a bit more complicated if it's not clear that our acts will be efficacious. So let's say the case of global warming. And um, there's the question of whether we should or we have an obligation to reduce our individual carbon footprint. Um, and a lot of us, you know, intuitively think, oh, we have an obligation to do something, but some argue that um, our individual actions will be causally inefficacious, that we will not make a difference to um, a, a significant difference to um, greenhouse gas emissions by, by our individual action. Um, and then that, that that speaks against um, a moral duty for us to, to do this, that it should be something that has to happen at the, the wider level, at the bigger level, at the, at the, the level of government. Um, now, of course, some dispute that our actions uh, are causally inefficacious. So there's some authors who argue that small differences that we make uh, make a difference to, to the suffering of others or to the lives and well-being of others in the future even if they appear to be very small um, effects. Um, and Derek Carfit um, emphasizes that our, our criticizes given in our increasingly interconnected, interconnected and globalized world, he criticizes our ignoring the effects of sets of acts or ignoring small or imperceptible effects. So his argument is that even if um, something that we do changes our carbon footprint by only a small amount. If in the future, the effect of that change, even if it's small, is to affect very, very many people, then that needs to be taken into consideration. The number of people that it might affect, even if it's only a tiny difference, too many. Now, some other authors argue that, um, so for example, Walter Sinnott Armstrong, he argues that while it's intuitive or we think that we should do something at an individual level, when we try and find a principle that supports it, when um, in the face of fears of that our, our actions won't make much difference, it's hard to find a principle that can uh, support the need for individual action with respect to reducing our carbon footprint. However, Sinnott Armstrong and nearly all authors who write on, on this topic um, argue that we have duties to promote collective action. That we have duties to promote collective action, that we have a weekly sort of a weak collective duty to try and mitigate climate change um, and we have duties then to promote the need to do this. So a different author, Elizabeth Cripps, Cripps sorry, argues that in the absence of collective action, the primary individual duty is to promote such action. Um, so to try and um, advocate for such action, to try and do things that will um, encourage um, others and institutions um, to address the problem of global warming and that is our duty. So some authors argue that we, we in having governments, um, entrust them with certain duties and in the absence of them fulfilling them or doing them, then the, the, it falls back on ourselves to do something about them, to do something about it. And promoting such action then is something that is required of us. 
But then some other authors, so let's say Mary and Hordequin, she argues that local actions themselves and our duty to promote action may, may involve some local actions on our part, reducing our own carbon footprint. It may turn out to be an important catalyst um, for emerging collective agreements. And there's a sort of amplifying effect of green behaviours. Doing certain things might encourage others. It sends out a sort of message um, to others. And she also says it would seem odd to say that we only have a duty to promote collective action and not to um, emit less greenhouse gases personally. That it would seem somewhat hypocritical to say we have a duty to promote that others do it and not do it ourselves. So there are some different responses um, to the, the, the worry that, um, or the sort of um, a feeling of being torn that we um, have the situation that we should do something, and then the worry that should we really do it when it will make no difference, or the way that it might make no difference at the individual, our individual action might make no difference. I wanted to mention just another thing. I hope, how are we for time, Liz? If my clock is stopped. Uh, we just after one o'clock, Emma, so um, maybe if you go for another couple of minutes or so. Perfect, that's good. So I just wanted to mention another thing that um, was asked um, by, by, by yourselves. So the question of whether it's morally wrong to have children. Again, this is something that um, you may have heard being asked. Um, it's, it's something that wouldn't necessarily have been asked a number of uh, decades ago, but in, in increasing years, these arguments have come forth. So there have been different sorts of arguments for and against the permissibility or otherwise of having children. So a famous um, uh, philanthropic argument for antinatalism, the idea that it's morally wrong to have children, was advanced by a philosopher known as David Benatar. And Benatar argues that it is morally wrong to have children that's always morally wrong because it's inevitable that their lives will contain more bad than good for themselves. So that we should refrain from having children out of concern for the would-be person. And um, now Benatar doesn't say that once one is alive, that one should give up and and and, and not uh, try and make the most of life, but he does argue very strongly, very controversially, um, against bringing more children into the world, because he says that it usually means, it, it means always, sorry, that they would have, you would be bringing more suffering into the world, that they would have lives that contain more bad than good. There's a different sort of argument, which we might be called a misanthropic argument for antinatism, the idea that, that we shouldn't bring children into the world because, they, not that it would be bad for themselves, but that they would inevitably lead to more suffering for others or other things that bringing more things into the world will, will bring about more suffering for other humans, non-human animals, and the planet more generally. So we often hear that, that argument in events that, you know, for the, the, the well-being of the planet and the longevity of the planet, um, it would be good if humans were not here. But then on the other hand, some authors more recently have argued about a duty to, to procreate or suggested the possibility that we might have a duty. So a lot of authors disagree with the antinatalist approach and think that procreative autonomy and we have rights to procreate and we should have the liberty to do so. But more recently, one author has argued that maybe in certain circumstances, we might have a duty to procreate and um, that we might have a collective responsibility to have enough children to ensure that future people will not significantly be harmed by depopulation. So the idea that the new, a new generation is needed in order to avoid people dying from an unnecessary painful death. So let's say the last generation of people. So if we had, um, if we did depopulate, and this is the problem currently, but if it was the case that we were risking depopulating the world such that there would be a last generation of people aging and dependent for which there was no new generation to support them, then they would have quite a lot of suffering and that we might have in that situation a duty to procreate or at least a duty to procreate such that we avoid great harm to a potential last generation of people. Okay, so I know we're out of time. One more question that was asked that we might get to talk about in the discussion was whether should businesses should get involved or take a stand on ethical issues. 
So recently that's been the case a lot of businesses have taken a stand on the war in Ukraine on Roe versus Wade and whether businesses should um, take such a stand. Okay, <laughs> so we can talk about that discussion. So I hope that that was of interest that we addressed or spoke about some of the questions you raised and pointed just some further direction in practical ethics that we didn't get to cover in this course.